Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshak. Today we have Joe Robinson on. Before we get started, I want to remind you to subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it be the YouTube channel, hit subscribe and notifications. If it's on one of the podcasting ones, go ahead and subscribe there. We appreciate it. Tell a friend about it. Joe Robinson, uh, we, M- Mr. Near Z turned us on to Joe. He is a virtuoso guitar player. He won America's, not America, Australia's Got Talent, ran the, won the grand prize for that, and um, was brought to the United States by Tommy Emmanuel, famed guitar player. He's touring, he's a great artist and songwriter and, and record producer, produces some of his own records, as well as um, is touring with Rodney Crowell and um, Emmy Lou Harris, all the right people, Tommy Emmanuel. I mean, those are the names that are turn heads, you know, those are tip toppy, some big ones, top crust folks. So you always wonder, like, oh, well, if they think he's great, maybe he's really great. And I get all, I was telling Mike before, <laughs> That all these people will say, like, oh, man, you got to check out this guy. I saw him down at the lo- local tavern on the thing. And it's like, he should be the next thing. He's just as good as anything on the radio. And we're going to demonstrate. First, we want to welcome you to the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and you get that great Australian accent the whole show, too. Um, and we wanted to start it by showing them the difference between people that play. Of these. It's like, it's so hard to explain to your friends. Like, there's a whole other level of talent here in Nashville. Yeah. So we'd like to welcome you to the show, and maybe we could start off with you playing something. You, you bet. I had a one-way conversation with me, myself, and I about the way we've been living. Can't imagine why to get to where we're going. It's a cloudy compromise. You're mistaking if you think I'm taking. My eyes off the prize well, Maybe I've been distracted Quite possibly alright This big old bright and shiny world Has kept me up at night We all know that price tag Shouldn't come as no surprise You're mistaken if you think I'm taking My eyes off the prize Some days I live with no regrets Some days I just as soon forget Some days a diamond Some are stone Some things I just as soon leave alone So where does all this leave me? I can't really say I know I got more questions than answers Quite a ways to go I can't let that deter me This I realize You're mistaking everything I'm taking My eyes off the prize Some days I live with no regrets Some days I just as soon forget Some days a diamond some are stone Some things I just as soon leave alone I had a one-way conversation With me, myself, and I About the way we've been living Can't imagine why To get to where we're going It's a cloudy compromise You're mistaken if you think I'm taking My eyes off the prize My eyes off the prize my eyes off the prize. Ooh. That's incredible, man. All right. Oh, Mike, do you want to play something now? <laughs> yeah. Real quick. Just, I'm good, man. That's, that's yeah, I'm sure I'll let you grab start, his guitar. Start you can... the morning. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> that's a good wow. I don't, I don't know morning. any of those chords, by the way. 
<laughs> like I watched the whole performance. I, <laughs> no, I don't think I recognize no. one chord. Pe- pe- people ask me about playing different tunings, and I I don't know how to. I only play in standard tuning. Yeah, yeah. right. But I like you know finding different ways of playing. You know, like a C7 chord. People see that and don't know what it is, but it's just a C7. Yeah. So oh, I, sa- I, I, sa- I totally knew that, dude. S- same old chords, <laughs> just different. That's incredible. Well, why don't you well, go ahead and put your guitar up so you can get up close to the mic? We could talk to you. I just thought it'd be great. Sometimes, like we've had guys on and they play it, but they play on later in the show. So you're like, oh, I wonder if people got to that part of the show. So, and I wanted to give people scale too. You know, it's like, and it's like I'm grateful when people say, hey, you got to check out this guy that I saw. He's played down at Thursdays, and it's this awesome dude. He's you know incredible. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know that they get it. It's like it would be the equivalent, and I, and I do take a little bit of offense to it because it would be like the equivalent of me going in, into the aerospace industry and saying, I got some really good ideas for the space shuttle. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just the level of talent that is in this town. When you played that, I was literally smiling. I could feel myself smiling yeah. the entire time. So, That's good. Great yeah. stuff, man. And, and I read from your bio that you're from the bush, like literally the bush. Yeah. So, like, the way out back. Yeah, no, uh, well, you know, to me, the bush is different from the outback. So the outback is kind of, you know, the, the, the desert, and, you know, people think of, you know, a lot of the middle of Australia is very arid, but I'm from the bush basically means, um, you know, up in the scrub, up in the sticks, in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a little farmhouse, and we got hot water in 2001 when I was about 10 years old. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was, like, really rustic. And, um, you know, we grew our own... F- food and uh you know it was just kind of like you know i'd wake up before dawn and go and split firewood and like lift the chickens up and get the eggs so was somebody in your family musically and, inclined i mean how do you living in the middle yeah. of nowhere i'm my assuming parents, you didn't have the internet if you didn't have hot water not not yet we got internet when i was a you know a teenager i was 15 or something and that, that, that was a great you know catalyst to me discovering a lot of great music but my, my mom played drums in a couple bands um, you know, and was work, I'm trying to imagine where these bands were playing in the bush. Yeah, well, you know, the 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 local town was about 45 minute drive away, and um, and you know, pe- people say to me, oh, you know, Joe, I I can't find work for my band, and I live in you know X Y Z city, and I'm like, man, if we could find gigs out in the bush, you can you can find it. We used to play like the local karate grading or the the local <laughs> you know football. <laughs> Um, you know, awards night, and we'd play at the schools, and we'd play, you know, just wh- wherever we, we, we could. And my mom's band, you know, they, they had um, s- seven women, and between them there were like 30 children. So every time they'd have a rehearsal, it would be just this huge party, and, and mum would be there playing on the drums, and, you know, they played kind of like, I remember them playing like Chain of Fools and all these great, you know, R&B standards. And, uh, and my dad plays, you know, a bit of music too. He played b- banjo and, and, and guitar and... You know, I grew up listening to Neil Young and Ry Cooter and Van Morrison and okay, yeah. just grew up around a lot of music. So did they, who got your first guitar? My grandmother, actually. Oh, really? And she, she, she's a, she, she was a wonderful musician. She, she was a classical pianist. And um, she gave me a little, you know, three-quarter size nylon string guitar when I was about, you know, five or six. And I went to a guitar teacher and said, you know, I'm ready to, to learn the guitar. And they said, no, your, your fingers are too small. You're too young. Come back in a few years, which is good advice. But, you know, I think that planted the seed in me to being like, all right, he says I can't do it. I'm going to figure out how to it's, do, yeah. it's how to a do true, this. <laughs> it's a true story of purpose. Like, so you come from just sort of the most illogical place, right? And yet your purpose drives you to eventually get to a point where you're winning Australia's Got Talent. And then coming, you know, it's like, you look at like, it's, I don't believe that the universe is random. You know, there's some purpose in you that now has yeah. you in the biggest music city in the world. Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you explain that? Like, did you feel some divine intervention or purpose driving you towards, like, it could have happened any other way, but you still would have ended up here. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember just growing up and like, just not having a lot to do. <laughs> and you can only make so many cubby houses in the bush out of sticks. <laughs> and, uh, and when I discovered the guitar, you know, I was kind of like, I could just see how it worked. And I could see, I could visualize myself getting really good. And um, I just became obsessed with it. And, um, and, you know, I'd go to school and all my friends would be kind of more plugged into the world. And I was just filled with this inner you know, determination to get out there and be somebody and make something of myself. So I really think, you know, the conditioning of growing up 
in, in, in you know, in the, in the, the bush, um, you know, gave me the drive and passion and the, the time and the focus. And also my parents had a lot of musician friends. So I was hanging out with, you know, a lot of, you know, older people that I could, uh, you know, say, Hey, you know, how do you play that, that, you know, cool riff from XYZ song and, you know, how does Santana yeah. get this bend, this bending thing? I'd so ask what my, stops you from just staying in Australia and getting a record deal? I would think as the winner, you could have got a record deal. And Well, I came to Nashville for the first time. Um, you know, I, I grew up around uh, T- Tommy and Phil Emanuel. I met Tommy for the first time when I was 11 and Phil at the same time. And Phil became, Phil's Tom, Tommy's older brother um, who passed away a couple of years. He was a wonderful musician and great guy. And... Um, you know, he really was the one that said, Joe, you've got, you've got something really good going on. You know, he said, most kids are listening to some Limp Bizkit crap and here you are playing like Eric Johnson, Cliff Sedover and that Jerry Reed songs. And he ins- inspired me and said, he, ne- he said, you need to go to Nashville because that's where Tommy is. And, you know, you'll see so many great guitar players there and it'll be really inspiring for you. So I came to Nashville and- um, But there was no, there was no like carrot of, you could, you could have got a record deal in Australia. Yeah, well, I, I met Sony and, um, you know, I met the big cheese at Sony when I was like 13, 14. And um, uh, I played a gig at the basement in Sydney, which is which is kind of like the, you know, a, a, a really great venue that has since closed down. But I was like way underage and they had to sneak me in through the like fire escape and all that. But, um, you know, I, I had some exposure to the music industry pe- people. Um, but as soon as I came to Nashville, I... Um, well, my first experience was we stayed at like some sketchy hotel with like crack addicts in the stairwells and like something we booked on the internet. <laughs> I did the same like, thing. <laughs> and uh, and I had the, name, the names of two contacts here, um, Jeff Walker at Arista Media and Ralph Murphy at ASCAP, both, both of whom, you know, passed away. Um, but that, they, you know, were the first people I met in Nashville and they said, oh, Joe, you got to meet this person, this person, this person. And so they connected me with you know, three or four people. And then those people connected me with other people. Right. And, and, you know, by the end of the trip, and I also went door knocking on Music Row, you know, my mom was with me and I just was say, hey, I'm here. How old were you at this point? Uh, 15 or so. I said, I'm, I'm Joe, I play the guitar and, you know, I, I, can I play you my song? And, and sometimes they'd say yes, sometimes they say no, we're too busy, sorry. But um, I went back to Australia and I had a meeting with some, some Sony people and I said, oh, these are the people I met with in Nashville and I handed them, you know, a list of about 30 or 40 people that included, you know, um, you know, Luke Lewis and like, you know, he- heads of labels and all kinds of, you know, producers and hit songwriters and, and, um, and Frank Rogers who um, offered to produce an album on me and, and um, you know, but, but, but became a great friend and mentor. And I went back to, you know, Australia and said, yeah, this is what's going on in Nashville. I'm, I'm going back there as soon as I can. And, and they said, okay, well, we got this show, Australia's Got Talent coming up. That's what Sony said to me, they said. And, you know, we're looking for people to, to go on there and, you know, really make an impact. So if you're interested, and I said, sure. So I went down and played on the Australia's Got Talent show and they tried, me to get, they tried to get me to sign their contracts. I refused to sign any single one of them because I was so afraid of being trapped in Australia because I just wanted to come back to Nashville. So ever since I first came here, I had in my mind that I wanted to, to be here. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great music in Australia, but it's also, you know, um, you know, pretty separated from the rest of the world. <laughs> and I really connected with, you know, the, the music here. Did they allow you on the show without signing the contract? They, they did, and I had to, f- I had to fight my way through and I, I had an attorney you know who just basically explained the contract to me and said you know w- explain what what it would mean the ramifications of it and so I initially said no no way I'm signing that you know if you don't want me on the show that's fine but the first episode was was a standing ovation and I was kind of a big focus of the the narrative of the show and then by the semi-final they said okay Joe you really got to sign it now. And I said, no, I'm not signing it. You just cut me out if you need to. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to Nashville. <laughs> and they couldn't, of course, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm 16, you know, and so I'm a I'm pretty cocky little fella, young fella. And, uh, the, you know, they have kind of like this part of the show where um, they say, okay, everybody, it's up to you. You choose whether it's Smoking Joe that goes through or whether it's Spoons Perry, and she was a Spoons player um, from Western Australia. And um, 
and the audience like voted for me overwhelmingly apparently and so at that point they couldn't really cut me out <laughs> they didn't show e- up. E- easily <laughs> like who's running the legal department over there how do you even let this kid get on camera before you have him signed up well i i heard that you know i, I was apparently the first person to, to to win one of those shows without a contract um and then you know toward the the grand final I had the head of Fremantle Media and he said, Joe, I have like 19 programs on the air at the moment and you're causing me, you know, a lot of, you know, it's a real headache for me. So I just need you to sign the contract and be done with it. Like you're going to do well from this show and, and we won't, you know, twist your arm. And I said, no, sorry, I'm good. I'm out of here. I know what the contract means and I'm going to Nashville. And, and he, you know, was a little annoyed, but... um. Maybe he liked that. Maybe he respected me for it. I had had the head of Sony in Australia call me at my house. And I remember talking to him and there's sheep in the background <laughs> and there's cows and my brother and sister are fighting. And, and I'm sitting there on the little landline going, oh, yes, well, I, I understand, you know, that what the contract means, but I'm, I'm just not interested. I just really want to go to Nashville. That's, that's where I'm at. You know, I got a fellow there who's going to produce an album on me and... Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to do. And, um, you know, he just said, oh, well, just think about it. And I just refused to sign. And it's a testament to the fact that that show was not rigged, that I was able to win, take away. That's true. Great point. 250 grand cash prize, which, um, was a great way for me to, um, The the contract is if it's the same as the one that's here, if it's the same company is they get first right to sign you in the contract, correct, to Sony? Yeah. yeah. But he didn't sign that contract. No, he didn't sign the contract. <laughs> yeah, but he would have been a Sony artist in Australia right now. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and they get management f- for like 20 or 25%. And, right. you know, it, it just was all, it just all felt wrong. And um, That's tough, dude. I can't tell you the amount of friends that I've had that get a cut on a giant record or they get a song that becomes a single and... And they're one of the co-writers on it, and they don't—they don't have a publishing deal. There's always that move that the record companies and the publishers make, where it's like, "Oh yeah, you want a publishing deal now that you've t- mm-hmm. taken the last ten years of your life, and now you finally have a hit, and we're gonna like now take your publishing." And it's so persuasive because it's this allure of like Big Brother or Sugar Daddy is gonna take care of you. You're gonna be on a major label now. You're gonna have all the things that major labels bring. I can't believe that a 16-year-old is able to withstand the pressure of that I know. If, 30 and 40 year olds that crumble under it. Yeah, well, to be honest, if I was 18, 19, maybe I wouldn't have. <laughs> um, maybe, I, maybe I would have, you know. Were your parents involved in that decision? Not, not really. They, 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 they really wild. weren't. Um, I, I'd made an album b- before that with a, um, a producer, you know, who was great and didn't charge me for the album, but he owns the masters to that album. And I remember just feeling like, oh, he owns my, my album. Like I wasn't you know, ha- ha- happy about that um, once I realized what it, what it meant. And um, so I just kind of had a little bit of experience in the, the world of, you know, um, not being taken advantage of, but having just something not go the way I wanted. So, um, yeah, I just was, I was honestly, I just love Nashville. I, I sat with Frank Rogers at, at the, um, the sound Sound Kitchen, I think. My mum and I took a taxi from Music Row out to Franklin. We were just like, where is this place? It's like, you know. It's behind where, the, it's where, behind where, the, um, <laughs> the Costco. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so we, we went in there. And the moment I saw a semi-truck full of Brad Paisley's guitars pull up, I was like, yeah, screw the bush. I'm coming to Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, is, That's cool. this is next level. So did you, you know. make a record with Frank Rogers? Yeah. Yeah, I made two albums with Frank, um, the, the first of which was an instrumental guitar album, and that, that was his idea. He said, Joe, you know, I, th- I just think you're, you're really great and you have really cool compositions, and I'd love to just help you make a, um, you know, a little solo guitar album. And, you know, I think with the, with the way you're playing, your energy, you know, you could just we could put you on, on stage in front of any act and you could, you know, make an impact and it could just be a really cool thing. So it, it, it was a really great thing of for him to do that to me and he really helped me with arrangements you know he's a great songwriter of course and um I learned I learned a lot from Frank and then the next album I did was you know full production and um and uh and that that was a very expensive a- album that I, I learned a lot d- during that process but um yeah I, I moved to Nashville when, when I was 18 I got a visa to play a, a festival <laughs> and the visa was three three years so I um just rented an apartment on 
um, you know, West End Avenue and have been here for 10 years now. That's amazing. So that's and All right, so the two records with Frank, and then I read that you had done one. Is the next one the one you did where you produced it and played all the instruments on it for the most part? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of, uh, you know, started to experiment more with producing things on, on my own. It was funny because, you, you know, you, you, you guys are um, part, part of the Nashville you know, studio community, and I remember in the studio, being in the studio with Justin Niebank mixing, and I told him everything I wanted. I said, <laughs> I said, I want you to do this to my guitar, and I want you to do this, and, and he said, Joe, he said, you, you need to, like, produce your own music, <laughs> because I can see that, <laughs> you know, you have a vision, and, you, and you're, um, you know, I can see you'll figure it out, um, and and I, I, I'm, I'm glad I did. I, I'm glad I learned how to record. You know, I started doing more sessions and getting called for that. So I had experience in the studio with I know every record's and, different. You have like an affinity for them like they're your own children. But when you look at the Frank Rogers record, the produced record, and you look at the one that you did, do you feel like you got to the same, the bar was at the same height? Would you compare uh, those records and say they're shoulder to shoulder? No. I think, um, you know, one thing I learned doing it on my own was that, that I do need other people. <laughs> and that I do need yeah. that collaborative mm -hmm. instance that's working, that's not working. You know, I mean, Frank has a lot of experience and not only Frank, but all the people involved in, in that album. But my, my own produced album, you know, cost a fraction of, right. of what that did. And my audience l liked it more <laughs> in, in that it was a, you know, it was just kind of a more raw presentation of, you know, what I do, um, rather than, you know, really slick production and, and, you know, the songs were, were really strong in that. I mean, there was, there was a lot of energy that went into the al album, uh, albums I did with Frank and my most popular album is just a solo guitar album. You know, people, mm -hmm. people like that, you know, or, you know, in, in, in Europe and Japan and different places that it's quite a pop popular city of mine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I like to, just have a feeling of, you know, doing something new and exciting when making an album. And sometimes that can be, for me, making it on my own, like I'm making one on my own at the moment. And I also have just made one with Brent Mayer. And, um, and that's been a true collaboration. We've written every song together and, uh, you know, it's just absolutely stunning. So, um, you know, I enjoy being in this town and being part of the collaborative That's environment. That's part of the, um, many levels. the struggle here in town. Like, so you're a songwriter, you come to town and, and a lot of guys, more so now than ever, are making their own demos, right? It used to be in the old days, which is like very rare. When I came in 2002, I was kind of an oddball cutting my own demos, you know, uh, and playing most of the stuff, you know, just hunkering down and doing it. And there's always that question you have like, oh, do I do it? with the 10, 2, and 6 Nashville session guys because the continuity feels like what's on the radio or do I try to do something that's truly, you know, you do your own record and your DNA is all over it. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe interesting that you say your fans really love the one record that was, you know, you doing a lot of it. It's, it's probably a bit different, right? And it's like there's personality there. Whereas, you know, some people say, hey, it's safe to go ahead and do it like Nashville does it and it's everybody's used to hearing that stuff. But there is a specialness also that comes with like, hey, you just sitting down and playing everything, hunkering down and track building something over a longer period of time that really has every aspect of who you are on it. It's truly unique. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I, I really, maybe this is not the, the best way to, to view it, but I really try and see the long-term picture and for me I think the most important thing for me right now is to learn and grow and to just develop an experience and be out of my comfort zone a little bit um and sometimes you know like I'm really glad I have produced and mixed an album and understood right. ev every gives step you, of what goes into that it makes you a better artist makes me a better even artist you, makes me a better musician even when you're not doing that stuff I mean e even just like mixing an album and writing it you know things and I think about that when I'm on stage. <laughs> when I'm playing, I'm thinking of the tone and how it's fitting with the track and when I need to cut through and when I need to blend. And, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of, um, you know, value in that, in that for me. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a kind of person that likes to, you know, make a lot of music and do a lot of things. Yeah, it's so great. That's a, a great point a too. learning journey. It's great. Like I'll have a little bit of diet of like really unique stuff that maybe you're doing 100% of. 
and some stuff that you're collaborating. You know, Brent Mayer's awesome. We want to get him on the program. We've got to get him on. He's truly an old school approach. He's a legend. He's not interested in doing it the new way. Yeah, that's why you know? well, we did alone well, I think, because, you know, I didn't grow up listening to, uh, you know, any of the mainstream kind of music. You know, I was listening to Wes Montgomery and, yeah. and um, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Ry Cooter. And, uh, and still, you know, I kind of just have no idea what's going on in the charts. And every time I listen to the radio, occasionally I hear something that I think is really great and different and stands out. But, you know, usually I just go and listen to my favorite albums and I want to make music that people can, you know, enjoy listening to. I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't feel a part of that whole mainstream thing although i want to i want a, a tv show <laughs> and right i i think you know i'm a mainstream you know likable person who makes music that you can enjoy listening to but I, I just don't um you know see myself in the context of you know anything super what's what's your version of success like what would be a success for you here in nashville uh well i i, I think um just continuing to to build and grow. I mean, I want I want to be the, the greatest musical artist in the history of the human species. That's awesome. <laughs> like that's my goal. Amazing. <laughs> but what does and, that mean? Does that mean playing for stadiums, or does it have nothing to do with it? Is it more about the song and the art of it? Well, I'm I'm not sure. It 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 really. I'm really interested in being great. I'm not as interested in being popular, but I think. I think that comes from doing something. It's a natural right? byproduct, of right? It's yeah. A, yeah. And um, you know, I just love music, and I I want to sh- spread as much joy in the world th- through music as, as I can. You know, I've been doing live stream concerts since this, um, you know, beginning of the COVID nineteen thing, and um, you know, I made the live stream charts, post our live stream charts l- last week, and you know, I had you know sixty, seventy thousand people watch the video or something, and it's amazing how many people out there are hungry right. to you know just experience something that's real and raw, and you know, I've spent you know ten thousand hours times three <laughs> yeah. playing my instrument, and uh, and I still love it more than ever, and I think that's that's the role of we're you seeing know, a renaissance in guitar too. Yeah, we uh, yeah. we were talking about this. There was some sort of statistic we saw that um, guitar sales during COVID yeah. are the yeah. highest they've been in like 20 years or something like that, 30 yeah. years or something like that, which is really cool to see like all these young people getting into playing guitar and stuff, you know, because they can go online now on YouTube and dial up Joe Ross and, right. <laughs> and like, you know, watch closely close-ups of what you're doing and yeah, stuff and it's get like, the tutorial on it we never had that experience growing up like that right. you know like it's it's a whole different it's so cool to me to watch you know you know we're in this computer generation so when you see someone playing something so analog like a guitar it, i don't know it brings joy to me man. i love watching kids like <laughs> yeah. get into guitar well, what does know? guitar take guitar takes um it's attrition you have to do it yeah. sound crappy for six months before you can make it sound good. It's like the violin, you know? It's <laughs> right. like it takes a while. To, it's, there's zero <laughs> instant gratification. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, in a world that we live in, there's a lot competing for that. It's saying, hey, I'll, I'll pay off earlier. I'll give you gratification yeah. right now. Sure. So it's really cool that, that folks are doing that. And I think it was, um, I think that was uh, Andreas Ferraro that was saying that, wasn't it? I could you know, be. I think that folks are just, you know, this this sequestered period has given people time to say, oh, what do I want to woodshed on? You know, I want to do something that's, that I can get into the details of. And, and it's really cool too. Like you say, you have 70,000 people that watch a stream. It's like, how does a music industry not look at that? I mean, that is organic. People can fake their Spotify <laughs> numbers. They can pay for views. They can pay for, you know, uh, for, for people, you know, just getting stats and numbers. They can pay for all that. We can't pay for that. So, like, if I were at a label, I'd be like, 70,000 people, that's, that's a motivating number. That's a lot of people. Yeah, no, it's, it, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's t- t- totally Me and Mike amazing. have a contract we want you to sign. <laughs> <laughs> just standard boilerplate stuff, uh, yeah. just for about being on the podcast and the next no lawyer, seven, <laughs> seven record option deal. Um, no, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing time. And, you know, I mean, music has been part of the human experience for so long. 
And it's just, it's such a, um, I'm so glad that I identified that as being my thing and my purpose and, wh- you know, what I want to do and what I want to give the Early. world. Early. Yeah, pre- pre- pretty early. And I just, you know, I, that wasn't really a choice. It was just kind of like a calling. Mm-hmm. And, um, and now I love sharing that passion. You know, I, I mean... I, I meet young people, you know, all over the place who come up to me with a maiden guitar and play me, you know, tell me a manual song or one of my songs, and 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 I'll I'll, I'll just, you know have so much joy in just encouraging them, and um, and showing them a few things and saying work on this, work on that because, you know, um, that's especially why I love fingerstyle guitar is it's just a all encompassing thing you, just, you have an orchestra that you can carry around yeah. you know that's why that's why i didn't like playing the piano when i was younger is i had to sit there you know with my back hunched and sit there and you know look down at these keys but with a guitar i can go up for a, a walk with the cows and like <laughs> compose something yeah, you're just you're, hang doing, out you're carrying the rhythm ba- <laughs> bass lines melody the whole nine it's crazy yeah. to watch so i mean i i I, th- I think music's really important and um and you know i, I i'm kind of oblivious to the the music industry in many ways and I'm 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 grateful that I get to hang with you know artists here in Nashville like like Rodney Crowell you know we've we've played you know for over 100 shows together now and every time I'm on stage with him I sit there and listen to those lyrics and he enchants people and it's I mean it's a religious experience it's absolutely um amazing and it's and it's a um I couldn't think of a better thing to do in my, you know, mid to late twenties than hang out with someone like that. And that's always great too. Whenever you have the respect of peers that you really look up to, I mean, Lou Harris. Yeah. I mean, yeah, she's she's such a cool person, and um, and such a an amazing, you know, you know, mu- musical icon. Um, you guys, and, have, you guys have that in common. You worked on Emmy Lou Harris. Yeah, one? I um, worked on Stumble to Grace. Wow, that's so cool. So is so you're playing in Emmy's band? Yeah. Who else is in the band? Um, Phil, Phil Madeira, um, Brian Owens, um, Brian Owens, Eamon McLaughlin. Um, it's it's Chris Donahue, and um, it, it's a it's really fun for me jumping in with with those guys who are you know much older and been doing it for many years. And I remember I, I turned up at the first rehearsal. And um, Ma- Ma- Maple Byrne, her, you know, t- tour manager and, and g- guitar tech and, you know, le- legend in his own right, he asked me to do it. He said, hey, will you come out with Emmy Lou and do a, um, I forget what the first show was. I think it was a, um, it was The Gorge in um, uh, Washington State. And um, I said, oh, sure, I'd love to do it. That'd be really an honor. And so I turned up at the rehearsal and I knew every song, and every lyric. <laughs> <laughs> and, and every, you know, the thing I had to figure out was the harmony parts because they all have harmony parts, you know, that they do and it kind of switches but whether one guy can do it or one guy can't do it. And so that that, that was, you know, a challenge. But Are you playing electric or acoustic or ele- both? Electric. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean the Red Dirt Boys. <laughs> um, but uh, Will, Will Kimbrough, um, you know, has been doing that for a while and, and I get called in, you know. Wasn't Maple um, out with Steve Martin? Yeah, he has fact, some great Steve Martin stories. I remember during the session. Yeah, I I read Steve Martin's book, and he talks about Maple in his book. That's amazing. <laughs> he talks about you know running around at the height of his you know huge comedy success, and Maple was like, you know, that's amazing. Taking care of everything behind the scenes. Now, do you know? I mean, obviously Keith Urban's the most famous Australian in the country music scene. Have you you know any context or tie to him? I know it's a huge country, and why would you? But I would just assume maybe uh, you yeah. bumped into him. Well, we, we've met a handful of times. Um, at studios around town and in and, and different d- different places, um, but we didn't, we never had a real connection. Um, to, Tommy Emmanuel and Keith, you know, go, go way back, and Tommy mentored Keith uh, early on. And um, you know, I was riding with Monty Powell one day, and and he said, I just texted Keith and told and told him we were riding together, and he's like, Oh, that guy's a great guitar player or something. So so he he kind of knows. Send me that text. <laughs> <laughs> Hold up your phone. I want to take a picture of that text. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, w- w- definitely when I first came here, every single person asked, you want to be the next Keith Urban? And to be honest, I didn't really know much about, you know, that world. I was into, like, Jerry Reed and Chet Atkins. Right. <laughs> and kind of like, you know, I, I, I was this, you know, 16, 17-year-old 
blonde kid from Australia, I guess they just, you know, right. put put me in that. Um, well, I wouldn't ask you about Keith, but I'm like, that's the dumbest thing to ask somebody. It's like, no. it'd be like, you know, hey, do you know this person? You know, because you're from a state, <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, I have. So Australia's I, an entire country. I, I would expect you to I have, know. Uh, I, I have a lot, a lot of respect for Keith and, and um, you know, and, and what, what he's achieved. And, and I love his records. And, you know, speaking about a, a song I enjoyed on the radio, I remember driving around and hearing Without You, mm. which is the track you wrote. Yeah, thank you. And, um, and just being like, oh, this is just, a breath of fresh air. It's just a beautiful song, oh, thanks. and it's really song. a nice pr- song. production and and performance and everything. Um, and in Australia, you know, I I came up within the country music kind of you know c- community, and um, and Keith is definitely you know the the guy who came over to Nashville and and made Did it. it. So yeah. uh, now, do you know Adam Brand? He's like sort of yeah, legendary over there, right? I mean, it's hard to know the context, but. Whenever he came over and was signed to Sony for a minute, and he had cut one of the a song that I had in my catalog, and and they sort of said he was the Kenny Chesney of Australia. Is that an accurate statement? Was he like? Yeah, I mean, I'm well. This kind country of this, music's not that. Is it big in Australia? I keep hearing like it's conflicting. Big. It's got oh, its own sh- scene, right? Yeah, I'm, I mean, Australia's not that big population-wise. It's about you know twenty million people, twenty-six million people. And it's you know the size of the the United States more or less. Yeah. Right. So it's just this big spread out, you know, place with like five million people in Sydney, and then you know a couple of smaller cities. When and someone then plays a show over there, <laughs> let's say like Emmylou Harris goes over there, not that she does, but let's say an artist that would have context goes over there, and is it five thousand, ten thousand people at a show? What is it? Yeah, I don't, I don't even really really know that. I mean, Australia has a big festival culture. You know, Australians love to drink and party. Um, so I think people say the pinnacle of the Australian music scene was before the DUI laws came in <laughs> because that, that was like pub, pub rock. That was where ACDC came from. Right. And, you know, all those, you know, pub rock bands were cold chisel. Um, but, uh, there's definitely a big festival culture and the, you know, there's, there's, you know, arena shows in Sydney and Melbourne for, for sure. I mean, it's very, very folks- multicultural cities, but as, as far as the Australian country music industry goes there's kind of the you know there's these popular figureheads adam brand's one of them and they're just kind of you know at the top and that they are where they're at where they are i mean so, sometimes those big artists play 200 seat you know listening rooms okay you know, it's, that's it's, what, that's it's, what it's i'm trying to figure out you look at, <laughs> yeah it's uh, you look at some of the guys like you know you got blake shelton who's making in keith who are making probably 20 to 50 million a year off of the shows they're doing and then they're touring and playing 40 cities at a guarantee of a million dollars a night you start to do the math on that and you're like wow these guys are really they're really rich is the do you think an artist and i don't you may not even know this do you think there's artists like that in australia that are no. super rich just no. off of the art or are they just sort of when, when i was a teenager you know i sat down with a manager of, of one of the biggest artists in australia and he said one of his biggest checks this year was from selling his wedding ph- photographs to the tabloids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so right. it's like... Perspective is everything, isn't it? You know, you know I, I mean, um, I, I think there's a lot of really important musicians and music in Australia. And there's great bands coming, like Tame Impala, you know, come, come out of Australia and came over here, opened for the Black Keys and blew up and became this, yeah, you know... Huge. Yeah, yeah, huge band and... and it's really Kevin's brainchild, and he's a brilliant person. Um, and there's there's so many really brilliant folks down there, but there's just not the population base to right, support so the, spread out. the level of touring as, as, as there is here. Um, so it's just it's just a different level, and I, and I think that's you know that's that's healthier in, in a sense. Like whenever I go to Europe, you know, I, I play you know three, four hundred, five hundred seat theaters, and it's like every night. There's people who come out to just see what's going on in the theater and enjoy the experience yeah, of the music, cool. yeah. and it's a more artisan kind of. Yeah, I wish I wish it was more know. that way in America. Yeah, and there's there's definitely pockets of that, and um and you know I I enjoy, you know I've I've traveled to, you know I don't know forty states or more now and played you know all kinds of places and, it's, it's a it's a wonderful place to 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 live and have a career. What as was a the musician. last time you were back? Uh it was last year. Usually go back once a year, but this this year. Was it um, after the fires? Yeah, it was right after the fires. And that's just like 
unbelievably de- like yeah, I was, 80% or something was yeah I, I was in tour on tour in um Portland I was playing with with Rodney and, I, and I'm sitting there in the hotel room and I'm looking at this app my brother's an engineer and he sent me this app where you can view the satellite hotspots of where you know there's fires and I watched our property surrounded by fires Holy man. and they did a forced evacuation and my dad wouldn't leave oh. and because you know he's been a firefighter he's fought fires there for years and he was just like I, I you know I'm going to stay and defend my property and my mom couldn't contact him because my dad doesn't have any kind of phone no landline nothing <laughs> god forbid a snake bites him out there he's you know right. he probably wouldn't get to the anti-venom in time right. but um the the fire tore through our entire property the house was okay my dad set an alarm every two hours and got up and put out spot fires around the, the yard really? wow but it, so I, it, I mean it nerves was of like steel. a steel go, garden goes to hose sleep. or what do you what do you do how do you put it out well, there's a photo of him with like a weed weed spray thing filled up really? with water. <laughs> but like, how do you go to sleep and say, oh, "I'll wake up in two hours and stop the impending, you know, uh, blaze yeah, from I, surrounding I, I my house"? I wouldn't re- recommend it. My my dad is a very stoic in, individual. Um, his his dream now is he's 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 going to sail to Tahiti. That's what he wants to do. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, but um. But yeah, the, the, those fires were really, really devastating. And uh, what were and the I numbers on it? Wasn't like a them. large percentage of the the country was on fire, right? Oh, I mean, huge, huge amounts. They said a billion animals passed. Yeah. Well, the fire just out the back of our property was like five hundred thousand acres. Mm. So wow. I mean, just you, you can't even imagine the 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 bushland that that went up. And um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a it's a real problem for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got to be tough being uh, thousands, 10,000 miles away while your country is burning. Yeah, it's, I mean, um, I, I moved here alone when I was, I was 18. And, um, and looking back, that was a really bold thing to do. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure I would have done it if I had have really thought it through. <laughs> but I was just following, you know, my instinct, trusting my, my intuition to... <laughs> to chase chase the, the music dream and um you know i miss my family a, a lot i miss a lot of things about australia um but i feel like i'm doing what i'm meant meant to be doing and uh yeah it, it is hard it was really hard just watching that app and just going right okay dad i remember I, I was on facetime with my mom and just saying okay yeah it seems like this hot spot has popped up you know across you know the, the western side of the property and that means that the whole property is surrounded and mom's going, oh God, I hope he's okay, you know, because they've done forced evacuations. And of course the news is just blaring like all kinds of disaster stories. And, mm. and then my dad, um, he called, there's a, there's a spot on the hill where you can get, you know, he has this, this little Nokia phone. <laughs> you can, you can like, it's awesome. Get a little bit of, and, um, and uh, she got a call and he said, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just unbelievable, you know, it's, 30 foot flames across the road and oh my goodness. I'm okay. But any, anyway, um, yeah. I mean, well, they, they, and, and did the, the house survive? Yeah. yeah well, good. Okay. Amazing. Well, nerves of steel, man. That guy's got, I guess that's why he lives in the bush <laughs> in Australia, yeah. not in Franklin, Tennessee. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's just like, all the insurance, we're insured. You know, let's just get out of here. Yeah, my, my dad's a character. You know, he just lives for, he loves to surf. You know, there's a, there's a beach you know, 35, 40 minutes away. And he's out there four or five days a week. That's amazing. You know, on his longboard. And that's his favorite thing in the world. So you're making this new record. You're making, a, you said you're doing some recording on your own, but you're also working with Brent Mayer. Uh, what's this? I know you've, near who turned you on to us. Um, he must be playing on that Brent Mayer record, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that record. Yeah, well, um, well, Brent and I wrote together. Um, you know, I, I'd been doing quite a few sessions for, for Brent and uh, written with a, a couple other artists that are with the, the Moraine Music Publishing Company that, you know, Br- Brent has. And um, Brent and I wrote together and we just wrote a really cool song and we're like, we we're thinking, well, Brent said, do you want to make a little recording of this? You know, we'd get Glenn Wolf to play some upright bass and Nia to come in and play some, you know, brushes on the snare and 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 we kind of thought that'd be a really cool idea so we went in there recorded and um we thought well well before we recorded do do you want to try and write another one see if we can get a a couple and so we wrote three songs 
and we went in there and recorded them and they just sounded so great so we just kept writing then we have 10 songs that's so cool. and um that's a yeah. great way to do it by the way yeah it's it really feels like a true collaboration and, and i you know brent has a lot of r&b instincts and um you know he's a groove he's a groove musician <laughs> and um and uh and we, we we really i don't know just uh he's one of my favorite collaborators that i've met in in nashville you know after writing i've written with hundreds of people here and he's one of my absolute favorite favorite people and so we, we went in and uh yeah glenn wharf and nia and um john jarvis played some you know some B- b3 and whatnot and wendy mote and saints and backgrounds and it's just a really great collection of songs i'm so proud of it and you know brent has the magic touch behind the console and when he has his little talk back button he just always knows what to say <laughs> and he um he's just a great a great leader in the studio and um and you know he and charles yingling they get great sounds in there so it's it's gonna be a a, a really strong album that i'm i'm very excited about i was saying to joe earlier that you know near's one of my closest friends and Rarely do I ever hear Nier talk about the record he just played on, you know? And I remember him calling me and go, dude, <laughs> you have to hear this guy. His name is Joe Robinson, and he's unbelievable. Wow. And the last time I heard Nier talk like that was with John Mayer. Really? Yeah, the, yeah. Early, the first John Mayer record. But I don't hear him say it very much, but he like went out of his way to tell me about he, it. He is, Nier is an incredible... He's, he's, he's you know, club. I'm. I mean, every time I, I work with him, he he surprises me in in, in different different right. ways. This yeah. is a guy that he's an artist. Um, yeah, he he brings a hundred and fifty percent. He does every every bar, and uh, and you know, it's 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 rare to find someone who cares as deeply about yes about the music as, yeah. as, as him. Yeah, in a town where it's like people were paid, and some of them end up being a little bit like you can perceive it as not caring or mm-hmm. not having an opinion and you get a guy like near in where it's like he brings it in like he joined the band every time yeah. you know like you're gonna have a fight out in the van about it later <laughs> you know it's like the, next, the way to the next city you know and it's like man that's really cool that somebody is like that committed to other people's music and it really is a testament like mike said when he mentions that it's like oh, okay it's everybody just rare that, it's just very rare when you hear him does. say that you're like okay i got to I got to see this dude, you know. Then he pulled up a bunch of videos. We were over at Buddy's house, showed a bunch of videos of you playing, and we were just like, "Really? Okay." Yeah. That's that's that really makes me. Where where can people find you online? Uh, JoeRobinson.com is my website. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that I'm um, you know posting a lot more on these days, and I do live every week. Um, I also have a for any guitar players out there, I have a channel with True Fire, which is an educational oh, yeah. sure. you know gu- guitar. Um, channel and it's called Guitar Synergy and it's linked you know on all my socials um, and it's a you know there's 150 videos up there now of me teaching oh, wow. s- songs as well as you know my whole technique you know from left hand technique to right hand technique to you know my whole methodology That's and my cool. practice routines wow. everything and um, uh, all the normal Twitters yep Joe Instagram, Robinson on Twitter and Facebook. Facebook, you can find me. All right, we'll so. find all those and put them down in the description. I was wondering if you'd be willing to play us maybe like an acoustic piece sure. from your, one of your, whatever's your favorite. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll play in my fastball. Play us By out. By the way, is that guitar available for people to buy? This is your signature series? It, it, um, it practically is. Okay. So uh, I have a new signature model with, with Maiden, and um, they're shipping some to the States right now. Okay. So uh, it's called the, the JR Signature. Nice. Um, this one was made in the custom shop. And basically what they've done is they've made a production line version of this guitar that is, um, it's stunning. So. Wow. Um, cool. Yeah. Ma- Maiden guitars, I, um, you know, I love. And, and yeah. when, when I walked in, you say, you have a Maiden guitar. Right? Well, all, every, every good Australian guitar player I've ever met always plays me. Yeah, it's like a Paul Reed Smith. You know, when you see a dude chat with Paul Reed Smith, you know he's like... Saying he knows a... Yeah.
Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having me, fellas. Thank you, man. All right, that's it for us. We're signing off this week from the West Barn.